listening to Talking Law, the podcast where business owners just like you discover how to avoid legal landmines and build value using smart legal tips. Join your host, Joanna Oki, as she cuts through the legal jargon and gives you clear and simple actionable legal strategies, which will get you optimal business results. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to Talking Law. Today we're talking about indemnity clauses and how we can demystify them for you. Why is this important? Indemnity clauses often carry an enormous amount of risk that can often far exceed the value of a contract. But the thing is people often just don't understand what they're signing. I've seen countless indemnity clauses that clients have inadvertently accepted that create risks that are completely inappropriate. And the thing is that people are signing these clauses or signing up to these highly risky indemnities because they simply just don't understand what it is that they're reading and they don't understand the risk in what they're reading. And sometimes they don't understand what they can do in very simple ways to reduce that risk. On the flip side, often I see clients have clauses within their agreements that are inappropriate, either because they overshoot the mark or because they're not sufficient enough. And that can create large issues. Both of those approaches can create large issues. In cases where the indemnity is overreaching, you often find cases where clients or suppliers, whoever you're providing your agreement to, will constantly push back on that clause. So it creates an ongoing friction for the people that you're providing your contracts to. On the flip side, if your indemnity clauses aren't strong enough, then the issues you're creating is that you are opening yourself up to the risk that you needn't have if you had the appropriate indemnity clauses to begin with. So the point of today's discussion is to highlight some of the issues with indemnity clauses so that when you're looking at them, you can understand the risks and the considerations that you should be bearing in mind. And then also giving you the tools to be able to consider whether or not you need to go and seek external or extra advice in relation to these clauses before you sign them. Okay, so let's just start off with what an indemnity is. What is an indemnity? Essentially, an indemnity is a clause where one person agrees to compensate another if they suffer a loss. So we might see the wording something along the lines of party X agrees to indemnify and hold harmless party B from and against all loss that is suffered during the provision of the services. That's an example of an indemnity clause where X is protecting B against losses that might be uh, caused by certain activities. So um, this is not necessarily always lining up with who has primary liability under a clause. So whilst one person might be responsible for something, another person might be might agree to cover the cost. And essentially, that's what an insurance policy is, if you think about it. An insurer hasn't caused a loss, but they agree to indemnify or protect a party against any loss that they might suffer from a particular type of event in return for you paying an insurance policy premium. So an insurance policy is a great example of a very large indemnity clause. But we see indemnity clauses all the time in agreements. But I guess the point I wanted to make is that indemnity clauses can often go far far further than simply saying that the person who has caused the loss is responsible for the loss. So the element of who caused the loss isn't necessarily relevant for indemnity clauses because indemnity clauses are just all about who will pay for the loss. All right. So what are the issues that you need to consider when you're looking at an indemnity clause? One of the cases that always comes to mind for me when I'm talking about indemnities is the case of Qantas and Aravco. So this is a case that's back in the 90s, but I've always thought it was particularly interesting because it deals with some really interesting concepts and has an outcome that is not necessarily expected. (laughs) In fact, 
can sometimes feel a little bit shocking. So anyway, it's a fairly, uh, I'll make the fact scenario a bit simpler than it all is just for, for the ease of communicating the point. Essentially, a plane flew into Sydney airport and required some work to be done on it. So the pilot was handed an aircraft handling notice by Qantas and asked to sign it. The next day, services were performed on the aircraft. So together with the fee for parking the aircraft overnight, the service charges amounted to around about $5,000, so a fairly small bill. The following day, however, while the aircraft was still parked, another aircraft driven by a Qantas employee was driven into this aircraft, causing damage between half a million and a million dollars in value. So subsequently, the aircraft owner sued Qantas for the damage to the aircraft. Qantas admitted liability for the damage. Yes, they said, they put up their hands and said, yes, we agree, we drove into your aircraft with ours. But Qantas then sought indemnity for the damages that it had to pay. So a clause in that aircraft handling notice that it had handed over to the pilot, that the pilot had then signed, essentially said that no matter whether or not it was negligent, that Qantas would be indemnified from and against all liabilities and losses that related to the services that Qantas was providing. So this is what we call a negative indemnity clause, where a party seeks protection under indemnity and indemnity, even for losses that it has caused. And the interesting answer in this case was that even though Qantas was negligent, so it was it was agreed that Qantas was negligent, and that negligence caused the damage, it essentially was protected for the value of all of the damages by way of this indemnity. I.e., it was negligent but didn't have to pay because of this clause that it had in its agreement. And so I think that's a really important lesson for us when signing indemnities. In this situation, obviously, the aircraft handling notice was handed to someone who didn't have legal background and potentially didn't quite understand, or maybe didn't even read what they were signing. These indemnity clauses can be captured or, or stuck in all sorts of agreements that we sign in a business on an ongoing basis. So, and some of the more nasty types of indemnity clauses that I've seen are often there in the cases of transport. But in fact, difficult indemnity clauses and cla indemnity clauses that are simply not appropriate for the situation in which they are used come up time and time and time again. So, what then are the issues that we should be considering when we're looking at these indemnity clauses? So firstly, I want to start off with if you are the party seeking the protection of an indemnity clause. And to explain what I mean by that, I mean you have an indemnity clause in an agreement that you have with another party, either a client or supplier or other third party, where you have done a risk assessment and you have said, you, other party, for whatever reason, will be responsible for any of the loss that we might suffer in this situation. So for example, you might be dealing with a supplier and you might say, in relation to the things that the supplier is providing us, they will be responsible for damage that they cause during the period of time that they're providing us with these supplies. That's an example of the type of way that you might use an indemnity clause. So if you are the party that wants to use an indemnity clause for your protection, one of the first, first things you need to remember is an indemnity is only as good as the party that's giving it. So what that means is if you are using an indemnity for protection against some other risk or loss that you might suffer from some other third party, you can't move that primary liability. So if you're using an indemnity to protect you against the situation of a third party suing you, then this indemnity clause won't stop that third party necessarily from suing you. But essentially what it means is if that third party sues you, you then have the right to seek recovery from the party that's giving you the indemnity. But if the party who is giving you the indemnity doesn't have the funds to meet the loss that you've suffered, then the indemnity is essentially worthless. So you need to ensure that the indemnity is being used appropriately and that you understand why 
you are using the indemnity and how it might be used. If it's going to be used to protect you from risk that you might be suffering in relation to third parties, then you may need to make sure that the party that's giving you the indemnity has the sufficient resources to meet the cost of the indemnity or that it is properly insured. And so insurance is the most usual form of protection that we would be looking for to ensure that someone can meet their obligations under an indemnity. And that's often why in contracts, you will see a provision that requires the other party to have a certain level of insurance. Or if you're the party providing the indemnity, you might find that there's a clause in the agreement requiring you to provide a certain level of insurance. But remember, it's not enough just to have a clause that requires another party to have insurance. You really need to make sure that insurance is in place, which is also why if you're dealing with a large level of risk, you'll often see that one party will require the other to provide them with proof of insurance through handing over um, evidence of a certificate of currency of insurance. So that's the reasoning behind all of that. Essentially, it's making sure that the party who is giving the protection under an indemnity has the ability to meet the value of that indemnity. So what are some other things that we should be considering if you are requiring an indemnity. I think the very first thing that you should be doing is thinking about why you are requiring the indemnity. What risk are you trying to protect or reinforce? Then you need to make sure that the indemnity clause appropriately protects against that. Next, you need to consider who has the benefit of the indemnity. Is it just the business or does it also cover other entities that might need also to be protected. Say, for example, if the business you're part of is part of a wider group of companies, does it protect other companies within the group? Does it protect the directors and employees as well? Often we'll see indemnity clauses that will draw in other people to protect them as well under the indemnity clause. The next thing to consider is what are the types of losses that are covered by the indemnity? Does it cover special or consequential losses? For example, loss of profits might sometimes be considered to be a consequential loss and sometimes there'll be clauses within the indemnities that seek to carve out consequential losses. So if you want to protect loss in certain ways, just make sure that the other party hasn't drafted in words that reduce the protection that you're getting. And then the final thing, which I essentially covered in part in the last point, is is there any attempt to reduce the liability by the person that's providing the indemnity? So for example, some ways this might happen is they might put a cap on the liability, which the important thing to um, bear in mind in relation to a cap on a liability is that wherever there's a cap, you will then continue to be responsible for anything that is above that cap. So you need to make sure that if there is a cap, that the cap isn't too low or that you have the appropriate insurance that sits on the other side to make sure you're protected for the full value of the risk that sits outside of that cap. On the other hand, if you're the party that's giving the indemnity, So for example, if you are the supplier in a particular relationship or for some other reason you are providing an indemnity to another party, all of the same issues that I've covered earlier would apply to you as well. But one of the biggest considerations, so and tracking back in relation to those, we'll go through those again. Number one, what does the indemnity relate to? And what are the risks that relate to that? So you need to have a bit of a think about what the indemnity actually means to you and what the risks are that that are being created so that you can ensure that you, number one, make the right changes to the clause and number two, have the right commercial practices in place to protect you as much as possible from any of the risks that might be caused with the indemnity. You need to consider who has the benefit of the indemnity. So in providing the indemnity, are you indemnifying a wide class of other people? And if so, is that really appropriate? 
Thirdly, you need to think about what types of losses are covered by the indemnity. So for example, you might need to add in some clauses that limit your liability in relation to consequential loss. So for example, you might say, well, we might be happy to be responsible for any damage that is caused by us to your systems in providing some sort of services to you, but we won't be responsible for any lost income that you have suffered during that period or any brand damage that you might suffer during that period because we have no control over what you might claim in that regard. So, you know, that's an example of the sorts of clauses that you might put in there to protect yourself. And then finally, are there any other ways that you can reduce your liability? So once again, one of the options that might be open to you is putting a cap on that liability, maybe a cap that relates to the value of the services that you've provided or the goods that you've provided in a particular period of time. So i.e. capping it to the contract value, or you might have some other cap. But the important thing to bear in mind here is that you must make sure that your indemnity clauses line up with your insurance, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more in a couple of minutes. So what are some approaches to limiting the impact of indemnities? Common approaches to limiting the effect of indemnity provisions include the following sorts of things. Firstly, reducing the scope of the subject matter of the indemnity. So reducing what it is that you're protecting under an indemnity, limiting the losses to those that you directly cause and only to the extent that you cause those losses. So we're adding words in here like directly caused by. Reduce your liability to the extent that the other party has caused or contributed to any loss. So in this sense, we're talking about ensuring that if the other party has also helped to contribute to the loss, you're not going to be fully liable for the full amount of the loss. And as I said before, you might want to exclude consequential losses and add in a cap. And in the last area that both parties should be thinking about is insurance, because insurance is an important element that relates to indemnity clauses for both people who are giving indemnities and for people who are receiving the indemnities. So if you are giving indemnities, then insurance is a mitigation tool that you can use to minimise the risk associated with you giving broad indemnities. So it's important that you don't agree to any indemnity that might impact your ability to make a claim on any insurance policy that you have in place. So you don't want to be in the position where you have insurance cover for an indemnity you've agreed to give, but have then ended up in the situation where you have done something within that clause that limits the your ability to use your insurance policy. Worse still, you don't want the situation where you have completely contracted outside of what your insurance policy would normally cover. So you need to understand your insurance and understand how it will interact with your indemnity clauses. And on the flip side, if you are the party that is receiving the protection of the indemnity, then you also need to check that there's nothing within that clause that creates an insurance requirement for you. And as I said before, that might be if there is a cap on an indemnity that you are signing, an indemnity you're receiving, you might want to ensure that you have insurance that covers you for the value of the risk that you still have that sits above the value of that cap. So that's the outline. Indemnities are a really tricky topic. So hopefully I've helped to make some of the risks that are sitting in indemnity clauses clear. And hopefully it's not too confusing. (laughs) And I've got some fairly simple action steps that we can take out of this moving forward. So number one, make sure you don't sign something you don't understand. And I think that's an absolutely crucial and critical point because that's what is usually the case where problems that arise under indemnity clauses come in. People have simply just signed something that they don't understand and they've created a whole heap of risk and liability that they didn't need to create had they have understood it and made the appropriate changes. Number two, if you don't fully understand it, then get help, get assistance, don't bumble along or worse still, don't just simply see the heading indemnity and figure it must be okay because everyone signs them and skip over it. Seek advice. 
from someone who really deeply understands the indemnity environment in relation to your business. So number three, if you are receiving an indemnity, consider whether it's broad enough to protect you. And on the flip side, if you're giving an indemnity, ensure that you've built in appropriate protections in relation to the sorts of things that I've talked about all through this episode. And if you're not sure, then get advice. And number four, finally, consider the insurance implications, as we spoke about before. Well, look, that's all for today. If you want a bit more of information about this topic, head over to our website at talkinglaw.com.au for a free download on everything that we covered today, if you would like to have a look at it in more detail. Through that website, you'll also be able to download some other tools that may assist you in dealing with clauses like this and in other areas in agreements that you deal with. And you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal. If you'd like help with any of your indemnity clauses, or if you'd just like a general discussion in relation to how the things I've spoken about today apply in particular to your the business that you're dealing with or the contracts that you're dealing with. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. We'd be very, very grateful. And thanks for listening in. See you next time on Talking Law. Thanks for listening to Talking Law. Tune in next time for more smart legal tips and tricks to keep you clear of those legal landmines. If you want to get a download of today's show notes, head over to talkinglaw.com.au. Information in this podcast is general in nature, not legal advice. If you want advice for your business, visit talkinglaw.com.au.